Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Honestly, I feel privileged being with you all here today. How many of you are Muslim? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so we have one. Mashallah, mashallah. Uh, first off, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without his grace, without his mercy, without his forgiveness, I wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be here. We wouldn't all be here today, right? It's all through an invitation. And I always try to remind everyone that Islam is literally an invitation for you. Like how many times do we go to someone that isn't Muslim and we start to talk about it and they just do not understand? They just can't get it. And it's literally Allah who guides who he wills. And so Alhamdulillah, I wanted to really talk about my journey in Islam. And you know, maybe you all can connect through that journey. It's not easy, you know, we've all been, you know, had these struggles in our lives and maybe sometimes someone speaking to you that's relatable, that can understand will help you connect some of those questions that you've had. And so, you know, I come from a Latina household. My mother is from Guatemala and my father, he is Puerto Rican. And so I have six brothers and one sister. Alhamdulillah, um, we were raised in a Christian household. Um, my mom, she was, um, she came here at a very young age, and my father, unfortunately, he ended up leaving us when I was five years old. So my mother, you know, she struggled as a single mother, um, and so through all her endeavors and hardships, we got connected through the church. So the church, you know, really helped us try to find ourselves through life. They were very giving. You know, I went through a lot of obstacles trying to figure out the spirituality of it. So, you know, something that I realized throughout, the, you know, me being involved at the church was that um, there was a little bit of a disconnection when it came to understanding the spiritual aspect of it. And I see some of you, you know, nodding your head, yeah, because a lot of times what we read in the book is not what's being portrayed. There's a little disconnection there. And so, you know, then that becomes where we start to feel a little bit, you know, depressed and sad. And we're trying to get answers and we can't find them. And so, alhamdulillah, you know, um, you know, throughout my years, I was just, you know, in going through dark paths, you know, trying to find myself. I ended up being Catholic. So I went from Christianity, then I went into being Catholic. And then again, here we go, still that disconnection. I'm reading something, but it's not adding up, right? And so, you know, I was like, okay, I'm just going to take a break a little bit, you know, from religion and just try to find my way in the world. Well, that doesn't work out either because now I'm walking blindly. At least I had a little something to hold on to. You know, so and then I was like, okay. So I, at the, I was around 17 years old where um, I went off to college. I moved down south, and um, you know, I, my brother at the time, he ended up calling me, and he goes, um, he goes, Elena, you know, I want you to know that I became a Muslim. This was like my mentor in life, and uh, honestly, I ended up really being upset. It was a disappointment to me. I felt like he betrayed something that we, you know, didn't know of. It was like shocking to me. And I actually ended up disowning him because of it. I didn't want anything to do with him. So I went a whole year without talking to my brother. I still, you know, spoke to my mother. I still called her. I checked on her. And, um, and I would kind of ask about him. And he would tell me, oh... Um, he stopped going out. He stopped hanging out with these people. He stopped, you know, doing these things. And I was like, oh, that's good. I don't want to know anything about him. You know, it was just my stubborn ways. And, um, and so one day she tells me, you know, Esby? So we end up, his name is Esby, but we ended up calling him Abdurrahman after he took his shahada. That was his, like his new name. Um, so he says, Esby, he went to this place where they had a box. And it was a black box. It ended up being Umrah. He went to the Kaaba. And so I go, really? What's the Kaaba? You know, it just kind of made me realize, like, why do you have to go across 
the world in order to get some type of spiritual connection or what. So I started to wonder a little bit. And during this time, I said, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should go and read about Islam instead of me being, um, you know, negative and just being judgmental about it. And so I went to the, so back then, this is 25 years ago. Can you imagine? We didn't have any social media. We didn't have all the technology we have today. It was literally us going into the library and we had to research everything on the computer. And so I started to, um, you know, read books and read about the science behind, you know, Islam. And one of the books that really, really touched my heart was this book that was called What is Islam About by Yahya Air Merck. And it goes into like all the scientific reasoning behind why things happen. And I, and I really sat there and I said, oh my God, you know, like I started to cry a lot. And I was just like, is this just for real? You know, this is what I've been asking my whole life. You know, I couldn't believe the whole Trinity thing. Why do we have to go through this person to get to God? And this was like, I can actually feel connected to God alone. So that was one thing that really hit me when, when I decided to take that, that leap was the fact that a lot of these churches didn't explain to me or they felt like I only could get connected to him through them through going to the Sunday or talking to, that was the only connection. Now here, Islam, you have that self-reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anywhere you are. You can pray wherever you want. And for me, that was freeing. That's me being spiritually free and connected to him wherever I was. And I was like, oh my goodness, is this really, is this how it is? And so alhamdulillah, you know, so... At the age of 18, I decided to take my Shahada. And honestly, it was the greatest day of my life. I was down a wrong, you know, a dark path, and it brought me back to life, honestly. You know, 25 years now, I'm looking back, and I don't know where I would, end, would have ended up if I didn't, you know, take that decision, alhamdulillah. And it's all through his invitation, by the way. Um, and my journey began after I took my shahada because three months after I took my shahada, Ramadan came. And I was like, okay, you know, so I'm the type of person, whenever I, I go into something, I go 110 into it. And so here I'm like, Ramadan is coming. Now I got to order books. I got to read about it. I got to study. And, you know, at the time I was in school I lived down south. I was in a very rural area where no masjids were there. There was no family and no Muslims at all. And so I just had to really figure it out. Um, so I began to read about Ramadan. And one of the things that captured me was the fact that community, family, and connecting, eating, and joining. So that was something that I was really excited to be a part of. Um, so, you know, my first day of fasting um, was a little bit trying because, you know, again, I'm alone in this area where I have nobody. And um, I had my prayer times. So back then, again, we have to print everything out. So I had my prayer times up on the refrigerator and I would cross it off. OK, this time, OK, it was like a, a daily like accomplishment to do it. And so um so by the third day, you know, it got very repetitive, but and then I started to feel a sense of sadness and loneliness. And this is, it ended up hitting me a lot that everything that I read wasn't necessarily what I was supposed to feel, right? Everyone's experience is different. So whatever someone else is going through is not necessarily exactly what you're going to go through in life. Everyone is going to have a tailored way of doing things, right? Alhamdulillah. And so by the fifth day, I broke down. I'm going to be honest. I sat there and I just cried and I cried and I cried and I went into sujood and I was like, this is not supposed to be how, how Ramadan is, you know, supposed to play out. I'm supposed to have family and friends. And, you know, um, as time went on, 
I always got more and more connected to Allah. And so this was really his plan. At the end of the day, it was like he designed that time for me to just be connected to him. And by the second, third week, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he became my best friend. He became my confidant. He became my counselor. And I ended up slowly detaching myself from feeling the connection of people. By the fourth week, I felt so much peace in my life. I felt so much tranquility. And it was because it was a spiritual cleansing that I did not know was partaking. You know, I, I always like, okay, I'm just going to stop eating for, for a time period. But what else entails with this? And there was so much connected to it. Um, me building that relationship with God that I was never taught to do. It was almost you have to build the relationship with people or the priest or, you know, different people. When I did turn all of that to focus on just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's when I got completely disconnected and I said, oh my God, I am spiritually free. And it was probably the best feeling in the world and it made me who I am today. It made me be a person to now, this Ramadan, this is my reset button. This is me disconnecting myself from everything and everybody and just focusing on my spiritual healing, my spiritual connection. And so there's a lot of wisdom behind fasting, right? A lot of our desires that come with it. You know, some people, they say, oh, you're not going to eat from, you know, sundown to sunup or sunup. You know, they, it's not necessarily just not eating. I mean, think about it. You're, you're controlling all your desires. You're controlling not eating whenever you want. We have so much free will to eat whenever we want. Imagine like some people in the poor countries, they don't have that. So we're training ourselves to one, we're being empathetic, right? There's a reminder all the time on how, um, how privileged we are with food and the things we have here. Um, so that was one of the, the main things that I took from Ramadan was the fact that I had so much access to everything and now I have to really come to terms with myself with internal struggles that I had within myself. So, you know, after I ended up, you know, taking my shahada, then I, you know, had my first Ramadan. I moved back to Cleveland with my family. And subhanAllah, you know, my family, none of them, besides my brother, all of them were Christians still. And so here I'm coming back to a household where no one really understands us. You know, I'm, I'm trying to explain myself and they're not understanding it and so I ended up realizing that there's no explanation needed you know the Prophet وسلم, how did he give dawah right it was through his examples and that was exactly how my brother gave me dawah he really I didn't talk to him for a whole year and through the his ways of changing that's how I was able to connect um, and be like, wow, I really love this religion. Or look at Maria, she changed. Look, she stopped going out. She stopped being with such and such. Those small actions are so impactful. When you take your shahada, and I'm going to be honest, you're being watched. They're, they're waiting for you to slip up and say, see, she turned to be a Muslim and she did this, this and that. No, this is you showing them that you're actually practicing and you're being for real about this. And so that's one of the advices that I can give you. You know, I know some of you are, are worried about your families, but honestly, the dua is so powerful. The prayer is so powerful to help people. And he's the one that controls people's hearts. We don't do that. You know, I ended up learning that years down the line that um, I would try to ch change people and control their hearts. And that doesn't happen. It's all through his will. Um, some of you are fasting, right? So I, I wanted to also connect to if anybody here, you know, if it's too long for you or you guys have to take a break, let me know. I know, you know, your first Ramadan fasting, it becomes hard. So um, this is an open and safe space to feel free to, to let me know that, you know, you needed a break. Um, so, yeah, so after I ended up going and moving in, um, me and my brother, you know, he lived separate from me, but we kind of 
collaborated and we talked about our families and we would still enjoin with them, but we would not enjoin in their particular uh, holidays. So that's something that we had to do. Um, we had to set a little bit of barriers and um, and let them know like we're serious about this, but we're still going to be here as a sense of support. And we still love you guys. We still are here, whatever you need us, even more. So this is what I ended up doing is I became more resourceful for my mother. You know, being a Muslim, you know, it's an amana on us. It's an obligation for us to help our parents. This is huge. And so I took that very seriously. And through those efforts, uh, my mother, she, um, after six months of me being around her, she said to me, Elena, I want to be a Muslim. And she started crying. She said, you, you're just an amazing person. And I, I feel like I want to be, you know, part of this. And so for me, that was everything. She, she ended up taking her shahada and after she took her shahada, my sister did, and then my other two brothers did. And alhamdulillah, you know, 25 years later, my family became Muslim. And um, so another, th another story I want to go into is the fact that my brother, when he went to Umrah, he made two du'as. One of those du'as was that his family become Muslim. His second du'a um, was at the time that he had taken his shahada, he was married, and his wife decided to leave him. She did not want to be with a Muslim. And they had three children at the time, which, you know, to him it was very heartbreaking. Uh, he had to decide either I'm going to save myself or continue to be with my family. And he said, what good am I going to be if I'm going to stay with my family if I'm not good with God? And so he decided to, you know, to take his shahada and, and, and go that route. And so, um, subhanAllah, you know, after we all became Muslim, his wife ended up getting married to a Palestinian and his kids were raised in Islam. So Allahu Akbar, you know, so all of his du'as were, were answered to him. Uh, so the power of du'a again, I always say, just pray to him. He's there waiting for us. We leave him. He never leaves us. You know, he's waiting, sitting there waiting for us to pray to him. Uh, so, you know, then I ended up saying, okay, now I, you know, I have my family, but how do I enter the community space, right? So I think this is very challenging as well. But also what I got out of it was the fact that we always have a perception of us not being accepted, right? We're, we feel like automatically we're the outsiders. But realistically, we're really not because the shahada is so powerful. And what we felt to realize is that we just gained billions of brothers and sisters. Like anywhere you go in the world, if you see my sisters in Islam, if you see a hijabi, you're like, okay, I'm good, you know? <laughs> This is now just normal to us. And so I had to figure out how to get connected to different types of community. And so I just organically walked up to everyone. Salaamu Alaikum. My name is Elena and I am Latina. And that's what I started to do in the community. I would go up to people and I would shake their hand. And that was like me breaking that barrier of feeling like I'm an outsider. And so sometimes, and I always say this, Ask questions, because when you assume things, they're not actually what it is. And so one of my main focuses was, okay, I'm going to try to just be myself, because Islam is not really trying to change who you are. It's trying to enhance you, and it's trying to bring you on the right path. This is all we're doing. Some people say that, you know, Islam is, is so hard, and it's really not. Allah gave us the tools to make things easier for us. And so alhamdulillah, you know, um, by me reminding, those, reminding myself of those things and actually being um, educated in, in Islam too. So that was very important for me. Um, so through those efforts, um, I ended up, you know, um, getting married, by the way. My husband is sitting up here, mashallah, he's Palestinian. And, um, and I was able to adhere to different culture, right? So 
I'm a Latina. I like Spanish food. I love to be around family and friends. And so I'm getting married into a Palestinian household. They like food too, but you know, I like the sazon, the sofrito. I like to put the little Spanish stuff in the food. So I would go back and forth with my mother-in-law and she would make the Arabic food and I would throw in my Spanish seasoning, you know? <laughs> so that was like a good little, you know, that was her, you know, welcoming me, me welcoming her, you know, and, and it was just an amazing, you know, connection. But again, that doesn't happen all the time. I was fortunate enough to be married to someone who was open-minded, religious, and he saw me as a Muslim, you know? And, and so when you connect with people, you look at them as just a Muslim. We are brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah. And so, you know, after I got married and, um, and at the age of 27, now I'm gonna fast forward, um, at the age of 27, um, my brother ended up reaching out to a friend of his and they got connected to a person who they thought was my father. So, you know, my father, for those of you who are just showing up, my father left us when we, I was five years old. He walked out on us. My mother, you know, she was a single mom for a long time. And so we got connected to my father after 27 years. And, um, you know, I sat with my siblings and we decided to invite him. And at the time he lived in Arizona, we all lived in Cleveland. And, um, you know, we made that decision to, you know, bring him to just visit us and see, you know, and we agreed that we were not going to talk about the past. As Muslims, we, we have to learn how to let go of that. That's part of us growing, right? And so... My mother had a little bit, you know, of, and, and with, you know, every right, she had a little bit of, you know, resentment, but again, she trusted us and she said, okay, you know, bring him down. And so, you know, he came down and we opened our arms to him. We never talked about, you know, him leaving us. Um, we invited him to have dinner with us. We talked about, you know, our, our work and family, kids. And we spent the weekend with him, the whole entire weekend. Um, Saturday, we went to the zoo together. We spent time. Um, and so on Sunday, you know, it was time to, for him to leave. And, um, you know, he said bye to us. He hugged us. And as he was walking out to the door, he looked back and he goes, I want to be like you guys. He said, I want to I wanna be a Muslim. And so he left and he took his shahada. And you know, it could have went so many different ways, right? It could have went me being upset at him or me throwing things back at him or, but the fact that I was spiritually free and I was in a good place with God that that didn't matter to me. You know, in life, we hold on. We hold on to situations. We hold on to things that people have done to us. And it only affects us. It holds us back from growing. It holds us back from loving each other. We are all walking testimonies for Islam, and this is how we bring people to Islam. There's no other way to explain it, but for my father to have taken Shahada and, and him walking away from us, not even knowing us, was the, the, the best feeling in the world, right? After he took his Shahada, he left and we didn't talk to him for maybe 15 years. We never heard from him again. This past October, we received the phone call that my father had passed away. My siblings and I, we, we got together and we said, okay, he took his Shahada and he's a Muslim. 
Now keep in mind, my mother was a single child. She had no brothers, no sisters. She was an immigrant. She was here alone. I was raised alone with my siblings, that's it. And so I never knew my father's side of the family at all. So after, you know, after we found out that he had passed away, we came together and we said, we have to give him his right as a Muslim. We have to bury him Islamically because he's our father. And so we all flew to Connecticut. And, you know, when we got there, I ended up having 17 uncles and aunts. My father flew to Connecticut. He lived in Arizona. He flew to Connecticut because he wasn't feeling well, and he died where all his siblings were. And so we were united with all this family. And lo and behold, you know, a lot of the family members were pastors. <laughs> so half of the, the family were all pastors. So here we're sitting we're sitting in this gathering and we're telling them we want to bury him Islamically because this is his right. And they're saying no. Nothing indicated to us that he became Muslim. And so when we're sitting there, we're just like, oh my goodness, but he took Shahada, we know. And so right when we're sitting there, subhanAllah, a guy comes in in a wheelchair, he's being pushed in, and he goes, Salaamu Alaikum. And we're like, you know, me and my siblings are like, what? Wa alaikum salam. And then, so he is my nephew that lived with him, that used to go to the masjid, and he took his shahada. Allahu Akbar. And me and my brothers, we just, start, I started crying. I'm like, dude, I can't even make this up. This is like, so then they had to, they had no choice but to allow us to bury my, my father. And so we ended up burying him, alhamdulillah, Islamically. And, um, and it was truly, truly a blessing for us to have that privilege to do that. Um, so honestly, one of my, my biggest things is, and what I wanted to tell you all, is that this isn't a marathon. When you take this leap, you walk it through slowly. And you first start off with your intentions. You know, intentions play such a huge role in our lives. Whenever you do something, make sure you're doing it for the sake of Allah. If I'm giving something to someone, I'm giving it for the sake of Allah. If I'm going to the masjid, I'm doing it for the sake of Allah. Anything that you do, and then Allah will slowly guide you. You know, He is the one who guides. He starts opening doors for you. And so, alhamdulillah, I am now living in Sacramento. I am the charitable aid director of Al Mispa, a, a, a nonprofit organization that service, services over, I'm going to say, 12,000 refugees. We help refugees get resettled. Um, and I have an amazing family. See, I was this person that didn't have anyone, and now Allah brought amazing people, like even you all. You guys are amazing um, to be a part of and to be here. So Jazakumullah khairan for everything. I really appreciate you all. And I'm going to open the floor up for questions if, you, if anyone has any questions. Here, oh, she's going to bring you the mic. Assalamualaikum. Mashallah, that was an amazing story. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Interested. So her question was, what was my brother's reaction when I told him I took my shahada? He cried a lot. I, I could only imagine how he felt being alone. You know, and so for him, this was his prayer being answered. So he cried a lot, and we became more than best friends. He would call me four or five times. I couldn't get rid of him at that point. He would call me, so what did you do now? Did you make your prayer? Did you do this? He's like the Islam prayer guru. Like now everything had to go by him. So alhamdulillah, and he became my mahram. He became my wali, which now I had a protector. Um, so it became just an amazing thing. Alhamdulillah. Anybody else? 
anyone have this is a safe space please open up ask as many questions as you like um, I'm sure we're all in the same boat right everyone <laughs> Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Um, my question is, as like someone who's not a B-word, but let's say you know a lot of people who are B-words, how can you help them feel more comfortable with their journey? It's a born Muslim, right? You already know like certain number of practices, but however, we are also not perfect and you don't want to overwhelm your B-word friends or like people who are coming to you. So what are some of the steps that you could t take to make them like, you know, that you belong and you can do this and like not overwhelm them. That's a good question. Um, so some of the times when when reverts get connected to people, you know, to other Muslims that have been in it for a long time, they get overwhelmed sometimes because they try to fit in so much and they feel like they're not doing anything right. So I suggest just letting them be slowly. You know, um, if they put their hijab on wrong, that's okay. They'll get to, to put it on right. Or say, for instance, they're not doing the prayer correctly. Give them the tools, but let them do it at their pace. You know, sometimes we try to push them too much and it just becomes overwhelming. It takes, it takes a lot of time and effort. And so just being a support being a listener and allowing them to ask questions instead of you always directing them. So um, I know like a, a few sisters that they had, you know, sisters try to tell them, oh, go here, go, it becomes overwhelming. So just when they reach out to you, just be very resourceful for them and, and have, you know, your ears open to, to listen. And invite them over for food. You know, this is what they want. They love to sit and, and eat and connect, and that's amazing. So through food, you know, it's the hearts, you know, profounder. So just invite them over and just be their family. Really, that's what they want. And I'm sure sometimes a lot of us come to this is because we're lost. You know, we need that family support. And so um, that's the only way we get it is through other Muslims, you know. So I, I always suggest just, just be there as a, as a sense of support. Brothers, you guys are quiet. Is there um, any non-Muslims here? None? Yeah. Oh, mashallah. Oh, you're right now, mashallah. So we have non-Muslim and then none. I want to know what brought you here today. Can I, can I put, I'm sorry, I got to put you on the spot, but I want to hear from you. This is a mutual thing, you know. Um, can I, can you, Sister Lizette, can you give him the microphone? Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate um, you being vulnerable. And he said, Salaamu Alaikum, guys. Like, come on, you're already, it's, and I say this all the time. This is, everyone that is here is invited. This is by invitation alone, honestly. Like, you coming here, Allah opened the door for you to be here. And inshallah, you know, may he guide you to Islam if that's for you. Because, you and me can probably, you know, attest to this that we're blind and, you know, we can't see when we're not, you know. For me, when I took my shahada, I became unblind. And you're probably not feeling it right now, but if, if you decide to take your shahada, you're going to feel this load come off of you. And you're going to start to see everything clear. And that happened immediately. It was like I got a reset button and I'm just like, oh, you know, this is really what it, this is what I've been looking for. And again, that's only by invitation. So Alhamdulillah, you know, thank you for coming here and being a part of us. You are our family regardless. The doors are always open here in FCC. Anyone else? Would you like to would you like to say anything today? Yeah. Thank you for that story. What's your name? Dan and your name? Dan. <laughs> what? Dan and Dan, I'm telling you, he is the best of planners. You guys are meant for each other. <laughs> so, Dan, why don't you stick around and watch Dan take his shahada tonight? And maybe this might be something, an experience for you, inshallah. Well, Jazakallah khair and Dan and Dan for your story. I mean, and I commend your wife too because she was probably a good example to that, right? Alhamdulillah, see, through her examples, she was able to, to bring him in. So 
you know, again, this is one, an invitation, two, it's a community effort. And something that I want to just, before we leave, we have like five, four minutes before we head into the next room. MCC Pleasanton is literally a gem here. You have not only a masjid, but you also have a community center. MCC helps so many underprivileged you know, families out here. They provide so many resources. Make this your home. Make this your community. We work together with MCC all the way to Sacramento. We have a bridge where we give each other, you know, needy uh, resources. We help each other with, um, with all kinds of in-kind donations. And what I want to say is how I got really connected was becoming a volunteer. I would take, so, you know, our dean, after, you know, this is years down the line. You know, you perfect the salat. And then you, you know, you do the fasting. But and then we forget about the zakah aspect of it. Now, zakah is just not giving money. It's actually giving your time and doing things for the sake of Allah. And so throughout the years, you know, I wanted to still, you know, try to get connected and feel more, you know, sound. And what I did was I, I became purposeful to helping those in need. And so that balanced me out. And so what I tell you is, Give time to help those in need, and then you'll feel very connected. Um, so Jazakallah Khair and everyone for taking the time to be here today. I feel honored having you guys on and having iftar with you all too because now I got more family members, mashallah. And so um, so I'm going to be here until later on tonight. Feel free to come up to me, talk to me, and you know I'll be here as a resource as well. So assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's working now. Oh, my gosh. Now it's working. Oh, thank you. Here, here, here. Just take this one. Thank you so much. Uh, you had a lot of us tearing up and crying and snotting and everything. So thank you so much for your beautiful story. Um, may Allah reward you and bless you and allow you to come back here many more times. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now um, we're going to go break fast um, to have iftar. So what we're going to do is we can just go to the room, the banquet hall. If you guys don't know it, just follow the line. Um, and then we'll go there, break our fast, and then we'll go do salah. If you haven't registered to get your ticket to get your plate of food, if you you can get it after you break fast. We don't want you guys to miss um, doing that. And there will be a registration table up by the front door. Thank you all so much. And those of you who are not fasting, please stay with us and have dinner with us. Yeah. You know, just, just be a part of us. We appreciate it.